Hi guys, I'm going to take just a few minutes here and walk through the pre-lab questions for our kinetics lab. Hopefully they'll clear up any questions you might have um, about the questions uh, to get us ready for the lab. Uh, so again, we're going to be doing a lab on um, the chemistry of lactate dehydrogenase and that'll allow us to think about the potential chemistry that um, the malate dehydrogenase portion of our green fluorescent diffusion protein might um, might be able to do. So we're going to look at kind of standard kinetics uh, as well as the kinetics under high and low concentrations of inhibitor. And so moving into the first pre-lab question, it's uh, basically just asking you to think about the chemistry. It says write the reaction drawing out structures for the conversion of lactate to pyruvate by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. Be sure to include all required cofactors. So this image over here is the image that was in your um, lab handout. And this actually shows the chemistry um, sort of going in this forward direction here. So one of the things that we'll have to uh, consider is the fact that we are actually doing this chemistry going in the opposite direction. So we are looking at the chemistry going in that direction. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of draw out what that chemistry is. I'm going to draw these structures a little bit differently. I'm going to draw them more simply as skeletal structures. So again, if we draw the structure of lactate here. So here's the structure of lactate. And a necessary cofactor is NAD+, and a key here is that this is going to be colorless. That'll come into play in kind of our next couple of questions here. But this is a reversible reaction here, and we use it to generate the three carbon molecule pyruvate plus NADH. And the key here is that NADH is going to be yellow colored. And so we'll be able to measure the absorbance at 340 for that. So again, pretty straightforward for that first pre-lab question, just kind of identifying uh, the chemistry that's happening. Second uh, question asks us to think about what are we measuring again at 340? So I sort of give a preview of that on their previous um, slide here. NADH, when it's produced, is going to be a nice yellow color. So again, measuring something at 340 is going to be measuring something that is uh, yellow. So we're actually measuring the concentration of NADH. And would you predict A340 to be increasing or decreasing as a function of time? Justify your answer. So again, if we look back at our previous um, uh, equation that we have here, we are actually going to be producing NADH. So NADH will be a product. So NADH is a product, which means it's going to be appearing. And if that's the case, we would predict that we will see an increasing concentration of NADH, and so an increase in A340. So the last part here in kind of putting this together um, is to think about uh, how this would look visually. So this asks us to draw a sample plot of A340 as a function of time. So again, A340 as a function of time. And so again, thinking about what's happening as this reaction progresses, I'm going to go ahead and just copy this. So if we consider the chemistry that we know that's going on, what's going to happen as a function of time is we're going to see an increase in the concentration of um, the NADH product, and so we should see a increase here. So again, this asks us to think about background, high, and low concentrations. So again, if I think about what happens just kind of um, normally, I'm going to draw that with a dotted line here. So we're going to call this low lactate concentration. We'd expect to see an increase in 340 as a function of time. Now, as we increase the concentration of our substrate lactate, so again, as we increase the concentration of lactate, we're going to have a prediction that we should have an increase in the concentration of NADH. So I'm going to draw this as a solid line here for high lactate concentration. And just as a dotted line down here, I'm going to say that we would expect that our background reaction should be negligible. And so again, our background reaction, background reaction is going to be no enzyme added. 
we don't expect to see the appearance of the NADH product unless we add the uh, LDH enzyme that's necessary. So I should also put in here that we've got that LDH enzyme that's required there. So again, this is going to be our background reaction. And that's important because if we're using the concentration of NADH and that increase as a proxy for the activity of the enzyme, if there's some background reaction that's happening where NADH is just being converted into that, or uh, NAD plus is being converted into that NADH yellow color without the activity of the enzyme, we need to know that. So again, background reaction should be zero. Um, just kind of a little side note. Um, in the past, I have seen where people will show these sort of looking like this. And um, that's okay. What we really can do if we wanted to think about that is that is the reality of probably what's going on. And maybe what I've drawn over on the right is really just a reflection of the early time points here where the curves are more linear. So just a little side note there to think about with regards to that. All right, so that gets us for the first um, three parts of that uh, pre-lab question. So our next question here asks us to think about um, why we're doing this reaction three times over. So why are we performing this reaction in triplicate? So anytime we do something in triplicate, that's generally going to be validating the precision of our data. So validating data precision. Uh, and how will this affect how your points look like uh, in this sample plot? So again, each individual reaction, we're going to get to this sort of in the next, uh, next slide here in the next pre-lab question. So I'm going to actually jump ahead a little bit to answer the next pre-lab question, but it'll help us think about this. When we uh, plot, again, absorbance at 340 as a function of time, remember anytime we're looking at the increase in a metric, so again, the metric in this case would be A40 or A340, A as a function of time, what we're really looking at can be rate of the reaction. So if we look at the slope of this line, so the slope of this line is going to be the rate of the reaction. And again, that's just the change in something measurable as a function of a change in time. And what's measurable here is going to be the absorbance at 340. So when we get the slope, that's going to give us the rate of the reaction. We're going to do this three times, and then we're going to take the average of those numbers. So again, why we do something in, um, in, uh, in triplicate is to validate our data uh, with uh, precision. And when we think about how that is going to affect um, what your points look like, uh, what we're going to end up doing is we are going to plot the data as averages of our three trials with error bars. So again, getting to the second part of this question, what does the slope from a linear portion of these curves represent? So again, the slope is going to represent the rate of the reaction, and the units of the slope as we have it right now are going to be Again, the change in absorbance at 340 over time. And since absorbance units are really unitless, we're going to have uh, units of either reciprocal seconds or reciprocal minutes, depending on how you are plotting time. The last little piece here says, knowing that the molar extinction coefficient for the absorbance uh, or for NADH is a uh, 6 1,220 reciprocal molar reciprocal centimeters, and the path length for the cubets is one centimeter. How does that change the units of your answer from the previous question? So again, figure 12, 2 from your book looks, at, uh, looks like this, and this is similar to what we've seen uh, on our previous um, uh, graph that we drew, where we're looking at the appearance of product. as a function of time. But again, here the units that we have on this plot show concentration. 
And so what we need to recognize is that concentration and absorbance are related. So A340 is going to be proportional to concentration, and that proportionality is through Beer's Law. So the absorption is equal to the extinction coefficient times the bath length times the concentration. So at the end of the day, if we have the extinction coefficient, if we have the path length, we can use that to directly convert absorbance into concentration. So again, concentration is going to be equal to the absorbance times the extinction coefficient times the path length. And so that concentration will have units of molarity because that's the units that we have here in our extinction coefficient. So how does it change the units of, of our answer? Basically, we're going to be able to convert absorbance units into molarity, and so we're then going to have units of uh, rate of molar per second. And so change in molarity as a function of a change in time. So I hope that made sense. All right, so pre-lab question three asks us to think about what's going to happen to our plot if we have inhibitor. So again, I'm going to be thinking about this original plot that we had here, and rather than looking at different concentrations of lactate, now I'm going to look at the incorporation of an inhibitor. And so I'm still going to be looking at uh, the concentration, or I'm sorry, the absorbance as a function of time, so A340 as a function of time, and again, no inhibitor. I'm going to come back here and just copy this just so that we can sort of have a, a point of reference. So if we look at the previous plot that we sort of had here and we imagine that maybe sort of this represents kind of this situation and we imagine keeping the same concentration of lactate, what's going to happen if we add in inhibitor? Well, like the name implies, inhibitors should make the reaction more slow. And so if we have a low concentration of inhibitor, we might see something that looks like this. And if we have a high concentration of inhibitor, it's going to be making it even more slow. So pretty straightforward, but again, imagining we're going to have the same lactate concentration. But now as we add an inhibitor, the higher the concentration of inhibitor that we have, the slower the reaction is going to go. All right, so the last pre-lab question, again, has multiple parts here. Uh, it says part C uses the raw data from parts A and B and uses it to determine the michaelis menten kinetic parameters Vmax, Km, and Ki for lactate dehydrogenase and the competitor that we're going to use. So we want to think about what are the units for what we're calling initial velocity and what parameter from question two best represents this value. Um, so initial velocity is going to have um, units of molar per second. That's what we define the units of uh, initial velocity. And when we th think about the uh, parameter from question two that best represents um, this value, when we actually use our absorbance at 340, and then use the extinction coefficient and the path length to convert that to units of concentration, which are molar, we can take the slope of the line, which was the absorbance at 340 as a function of time, and then use the extinction coefficient and the path length to convert that into molar per second. So again, the kinetic parameter that best represents that is going to be um, the uh, slope of the line. Next question says, from parts A and B, there are 45 V naught um, values that are calculated. So again, we're going to have three different conditions, no inhibitor, low inhibitor, and high inhibitor. And so just to kind of highlight, the no inhibitor is going to be the first team that comes in. The low inhibitor is going to be the second team that comes in, and then the high inhibitor is going to be 
the third team that comes in. So each team is going to have five concentrations of lactate and they're going to take their data um, in triplicate. So they're going to repeat each reaction three times. So they're going to end up with 15 reactions. And so as a total, our entire three team group is going to end up with 45 V naught values that we calculate. So kind of drawing a sample plot um, for what we'd expect to see, um, it's going to look very similar to what we see here. So here is figure 12.7, but I'm going to actually draw it out by hand so we can kind of make sense out of it. So again, we're going to be looking at V naught as a function of substrate concentration. So just as kind of a reminder, I'm going to flip back here. When we talk about the slope that we have of this line, this slope is going to be V naught. So I'm just going to kind of highlight that here, that this V naught is what we're talking about in pre-lab question number four. So we measure the increase in, in absorbance for this reaction as a function of time. We get the slope that gives us a V naught value. We repeat that reaction two times and we're going to get two other V naught values. And so the first group again is going to have five different substrate concentrations that they utilize. What you're going to be plotting here is the average of three trials. And then because you're using the average of three trials, we can use the standard deviation to get our error bars. So this is not anything you'll need to uh, think about doing in lab uh, to, um, this Thursday for lab. This is actually stuff that we will do as a group together um, as everybody kind of brings all their data together the following week. So again, one group is going to get five data points here. Average of those three trials is going to give us um, an average velocity to plot and then we will have that be um, for our standard conditions. We're going to call this standard. So if we think about what happens as we start introducing an inhibitor, so again if we introduce an inhibitor here, we're going to make this reaction slower. So when we have a low inhibitor concentration, I'm just going to abbreviate inhibitor with I here, we're going to slow down the reaction here. Okay. And then when we have a higher concentration of inhibitor, we're going to make the reaction even slower. So again, this plot doesn't look really any different from what we see over there, uh, over here on the right, um, but I wanted to make sure that you understood how we created this plot. So again, initial velocity we get from the slopes of those lines. You're going to do reactions at five different substrate concentrations. Because you do each reaction in triplicate, you'll be able to plot an average and then use the standard deviation to give you the error bars there. All right, so what we're going to do on the next pre-lab question is we're going to say, you know what, let's take this same data and we're going to plot it a different way. So plotting this um, a different way. So again, here uh, on the left here, this sort of represents the, the plot that we had from before, where we're going to see an increase in our reaction velocity as we increase substrate concentration. Just want to kind of introduce a couple of terms here. Vmax represents the fastest the reaction can go. And what we'll see here is we'd have to go out to infinite substrate concentration if we wanted to get and reach and kind of close this gap that we have there. So the only way we're going to get up here is we're going to have to have infinitely high substrate concentration. And we're never really going to be able to get there. So mathematically, we'd really like to know at what substrate constant, or you know, at what is um, going to be that maximum velocity that we could get to. Experimentally, we're never going to be able to add enough substrate to get there, but we'd like to extrapolate out and get there. Another important kind of uh, piece to highlight here, remember halfway points are really important. So when we are at this important halfway point here, when we are at half of our maximum speed, that's a special value of substrate concentration. So 
one half of our maximum velocity is going to occur at some substrate concentration that we call Km. So Km can be thought of as the substrate concentration you need to be at in order for your reaction to be going half of its maximum speed. I'm going to say that again because I don't have it written here. When you want to be at half of your maximum velocity, you have to be at a substrate concentration that we define as Km. So again, Km is the substrate concentration you need to be at for your reaction to be half maximal. So relatively easy here to think about this, but mathematically it's really hard to get where does this blue line reach its final maximum. And unless we know what that maximum is, we can't figure out what halfway to it is. So what we do mathematically to solve this is we do something called a line weaver burke plot. So that's what this plot is called. It's a line weaver burke plot. And what we do is we plot the inverse of the um, initial velocity, that V naught, and the inverse of substrate concentration. So this is what we call a double reciprocal Plot because we plot 1 over the y value and 1 over the x value. But what's really neat about this is you take this same data and you make it into a straight line. Okay, so what do you need to do to sort of answer this question um, for part uh, C here? It says, how would your plot look different if you plotted this? All you really need to say is it would be a straight line. So to answer the pre-lab question, all you need to do is say that it would be a straight line. You don't have to draw anything, um, but I wanted to make sure you understood why we get a straight line and how we get a straight line. So I just want to take a second and show you um, just a couple of other ways that this can um, look different. So this plot that we had here basically took sort of what we're calling standard data, just kind of showing you what a line weaver burke plot looks like. I want to actually kind of show you what this would look like with inhibitory data. So there's two different ways that this inhibitory data could um, could look and that's important for us kind of figuring out the kind of inhibitor that that we have. And I'm not going to go into any details about really what this means. We're just going to call this inhibitor type 1 and this is inhibitor type 2. You don't need to understand why, but again, how would your plot look different if you plotted this double reciprocal? Your plot is now going to be a straight line. So very simple answer for pre-lab question um, for C is you just need to say it becomes a straight line. So when we move on now and think about information that we can obtain from these straight lines, remember when we have a straight line, straight line has um, the equation y equals mx plus b, and so we can get information from the slope, and we can get information from the y-intercept. So the kinetic parameter is basically just determined. The, I'm sorry, the kinetic parameter km is determined from the slope. So again, if we highlight here our slope information, so Km and the slope, so slope gives us Km, slope here gives us Km, don't worry about those alphas right yet, but we can see that we get information about Km from the slope. Now one of the things that we'll have to realize is that we actually need to get the V max value first, um, and that will allow us to determine Km. So again, flipping to this next slide here and thinking about how we uh, get information about Vmax. Vmax is found from the y-intercept. Okay, so Vmax is determined from the y-intercept. So all you need to do to answer these pre-lab questions is to say that Km is determined from the slope, and then Vmax is determined from the y-intercept. So when we think about this last pre-lab question, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail here, but when we think about how we want to calculate the kinetic parameter Ki, here we can see 
ki down here in this equation. And so I'm going to kind of expand on this equation a little bit to help us think about it. So alpha we can think of as a scaling factor for how much the inhibitor is 